What if Jesus mythicists are right? Mythicists do not believe Jesus existed, and many argue a myth where God died and resurrected was a common story in the ancient world that was retold in many different cultures. Jesus was just another one of these dying and rising gods. So there's no reason to think Jesus actually did rise from the dead. This was just a common myth retold in many cultures. There are many problems with trying to say Jesus is just another dying and rising god, as his resurrection is very different from any potential myths about this. In fact, some scholars even doubt there were pagan dying and rising gods to begin with. But let's say the mythicists are correct. There were many dying and rising gods in the ancient world, and Jesus' death and resurrection was similar to them. In fact, let's also grant that the gospel authors and the apostles were aware of these myths and wrote about Jesus in a way to parallel these other accounts. Would this mean Christianity is all a myth? Would this mean there is no reason to think Jesus rose from the dead? No. In fact, even if these assumptions are granted, it would not at all show the resurrection of Jesus was a myth or even put a dent in the truth of Christianity. As noted, let's grant the mythicist two assumptions. There were many dying and rising gods of the ancient world whose resurrections were similar to Jesus's. And two, the gospel authors were aware of these myths, which influenced the way they wrote. I'm skeptical of these assumptions, but many mythicists and skeptics who think Jesus existed, but still believe the account of his resurrection was a myth, have spent hours arguing for one or both of these points. This is often done not merely to show comparisons, but to actively argue Jesus' resurrection should also be understood as a myth. To say Jesus did really rise from the dead, but deny that Osiris or Inanna did not is special pleading on their view. For them, it makes more sense to see them all as myths because of the similar story features. But the main problem is the conclusion does not in any way follow from the argument. In other words, even if Jesus' resurrection is similar to myths about pagan dying and rising gods, and the gospel authors were aware of them, it would not support the notion that Jesus didn't physically rise from the dead, or that his story is mythical. Finding similarities in the gospels to what we find in myths does not prove the gospels are also mythical. Each account should be judged on its own merits as to whether it's historical, mythical, or a mixture of both. Finding some correlations does not mean both stories share every feature. To make that argument is an association fallacy. This is where someone finds overlap in some way and then unjustifiably assumes two things share overlap in other ways as well. An example would be if I said, both Todd and Mark grew up in a bad neighborhood, but Todd is a criminal. So we can therefore say Mark must also be a criminal because of the association they have. Or one could say Osiris was resurrected and Jesus was resurrected, but Osiris's resurrection was a myth. Therefore, the resurrection of Jesus is also a myth. Both of these examples are association fallacies, and it is what the mythicist or skeptic is doing when they try to debunk the resurrection of Jesus merely by arguing associations with mythical deities. Because of this, it would not be special pleading to say Jesus is historical and Osiris is not, as long as one has independent evidence to believe in Jesus, which the Christian has. But the skeptic could reply they're not saying this proves Jesus is a myth, only that it becomes a simpler explanation to say he is. After all, if it's true we have myths of dying and rising gods written before the Gospels, wouldn't it make more sense to say the resurrection of Jesus was just continuing this mythical theme? This doesn't logically follow for a number of reasons. First, Christians have independent reasons to believe the resurrection of Jesus happened, like appealing to internal and external evidence to support the truth of the New Testament. And second, throughout history we can find numerous stories that have similarities, and it does not follow they're all myths from this alone. Everyone knows the story of the famous ship that was said to be unsinkable, but hit an iceberg. The British ship was about 800 feet long, held about 2,500 passengers. It hit the iceberg at about 25 knots on the starboard side, about 400 nautical miles from Newfoundland. But many died because the ship had an insufficient number of lifeboats. We all know this story. It's the novel about the sinking of the Titan, a fictional work written in 1898. But oddly enough, 14 years later, a similar event happened that was historical. The real British ship, the Titanic, sunk after hitting an iceberg. The ship was 882 feet long and had about 2,200 passengers, 
it hit the iceberg at about 22.5 knots on the starboard side, about 400 nautical miles from Newfoundland, but many died because the ship had an insufficient amount of lifeboats. As strange as this is, there is no doubt the novel The Wreck of the Titan is a work of fiction. But after it was published, the historical sinking of the Titanic did occur 14 years later. We cannot say the existence of similarities alone is enough to suggest the sinking of the Titanic is also a work of fiction, especially since we have plenty of external evidence for the Titanic, and the way the historical account was written was not like a modern novel. Internal and external evidence helps us determine which is historical and which is fiction. The similarities are interesting, but prove nothing. This is not the only example. People often find episodes of The Simpsons that display strange things that ended up happening in real life. The creator has even been accused of being a time traveler. Before Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon, there were several novels and movies of people landing on the moon. We wouldn't assume the one historical event of landing on the moon must be fictional simply because prior to this, there were several fictional works of people going to the moon. And it would be silly to say it is special pleading to believe in the 1969 moon landing, but also believe the prior stories were works of fiction. After Shakespeare wrote the play Romeo and Juliet, often real life stories played out that bore similarities to Shakespeare's play. A young couple fell in love, but were forbidden by their parents, which ended in tragedy. No one would doubt these types of stories played out in real life, despite them being similar to the fictional work of Romeo and Juliet. In fact, it is human nature to notice parallels and highlight them. When we see a forbidden young love and in tragedy, we want to call it a Romeo and Juliet story. We even write about it intentionally to connect it to Shakespeare's play. No one doubts the similarities. We even highlight them and intentionally look for more. Writers love comparing the story of John F. Kennedy to Camelot, even though there are more differences than similarities. It is human nature to see the events you're experiencing and want to find parallels from history or fiction. I've heard pastors give sermons where they compare their life journey to Frodo in The Lord of the Rings or the story of Rocky Balboa. Merely making these comparisons in no way suggests they're saying their life stories are myths. People love to find parallels to what they experience. In fact, studies have demonstrated that human memory works better when random data can be shaped into interactive stories. We are a pattern-seeking species and often think there has to be a connection and coincidental similarities found in different stories. If we can classify an event we witnessed as a Romeo and Juliet story or a David and Goliath tale, it helps us to remember it better. We're designed to find patterns and similarities between stories, even unintentional ones. We see this same process in the ancient world, as authors often wrote in a way to parallel events from the past or works of fiction. Arnardo Mamiliano notes the imperial cult was grafted into the traditional patterns of the Greco-Roman religion, and that the cult of the imperial emperors followed the model of the apotheosis of Romulus. Mark Beck writes, it appears evident that structurally, Lucian modeled his life of Demonax on Xenophon's Agesilas. He notes this could mean Lucian's work was fictitious, but he concludes it's more likely that Lucian merely chose Xenophon's Agesilas as a work he wished to mimic when writing his own account of Demonax. Julius Caesar, in his commentary on the Spanish War, describes an event where his army faced off against Pompey's forces. One of Pompey's soldiers came forward and taunted Caesar's army, saying there was no man among them who would match him. Caesar then reported that one of his soldiers went out and accepted the challenge, but they were evenly matched, like the traditional encounter between Achilles and Memnon. So Julius Caesar witnessed a real-life event, but wrote about it in a way to parallel something he knew from fiction. It was customary for an ancient author to write about a non-fiction story in a way to parallel an already existing story. Cohen de Temmerman says, There is the general principle that in non-fictional narrative, there is a prior series of events on which the construction of the narrative is based. Such construction involves not just possible manipulation of the chronological order of the events through, for example, flashbacks and flash-forwards, but also the imposition of causal and other connections between various episodes, interpretation and coloring of events and characters. So ancient authors often wrote about the current events of their time in a way to follow the construction of already well-known stories. In fact, 
Plutarch told us that writers would seize on similarities and highlight them in their works on purpose. As Craig Keener said, the writer noting the parallels need only select, not fabricate the event. The gospel authors were no exception. They wrote about Jesus in a way to parallel already existing stories from the Old Testament. N.T. Wright notes Matthew wrote in a way to parallel Jesus to Moses. He intentionally highlighted specific events from the life of Jesus to paint him as a new Moses. Luke wrote in a way to make him look like King David. Mark paralleled Jesus to the prophets like Elijah and Jeremiah. In other words, they intentionally wrote about Jesus to connect him to other well-known stories from the Hebrew Bible. And if, for the sake of argument, Jesus actually did perform miracles that the people of the day witnessed, it would be natural for them to parallel them to the stories of miracles they knew from the Hebrew Scriptures. Albert Lord said, Traditional narrators tend to tell what happened in terms of already existing patterns of story. When I say that an incident in the gospel narrative of Jesus' life fits in a mythic pattern, there is no implication at all that this incident never happened. There is rather an implication that traditional narrators chose to remember and relate this incident because an incident of similar essence occurred in other traditional stories known to them and their predecessors. That its essence was consonant with an element in a traditional mythic, i.e. sacred pattern, adds a dimension of spiritual weight to the incident, but does not deny the historicity of the incident. Not only would such a tendency to make parallels be natural, but it would also be considered the mark of a skilled writer. So ancient authors would intentionally write in ways to find as many parallels as possible. To be able to quote the tradition from memory, to apply it in creative or appropriate ways, not only brings honor to the speaker, but lends authority to his words as well. For example, the Song of Zechariah, the Benedictus in Luke 1, 68-79, is stitched together from phrases in Psalm 41, 111, 132, 105, 106, and Micah 7. The ability to create such a mosaic implied extensive, detailed knowledge of the tradition and brought great honor to the speaker able to pull it off. There is no denying the biblical authors actively looked for parallels in the Old Testament to Jesus. The more they could find, the better. None of this means they invented stories about Jesus to fit with selected passages they had. Given the number of stories, psalms, and sayings throughout the Hebrew Bible, they were bound to find connections. When you have a large library to go through, you can easily find parallels from the past to the current events of your day. For more on this topic, you can see this other video. But back to the main point. If the Gospel authors were also aware of pagan myths about dying and rising gods and wanted to make connections, they most certainly could have. None of this would actually mean that Jesus never existed or never died and rose from the dead. Because even if this is what the Gospel authors were doing, it is equally possible they were employing the ancient artistic style of writing about the events one witnessed to fit with an already existing pattern or already well-known stories. Or on the other hand, it could be that they were not, and it is the modern skeptics who are seeing patterns where they were never intended to be seen. To explain what I mean, the scholar Mike Lacona gives an example of how we can see patterns in ancient works that were all written independently of each other. None of these authors were intentionally trying to make similarities between their works. But despite that, we can read how the death of Hector, which is fictional, paralleled the death of Pompey, which is historical, as well as the death of Jesus, also historical. Achilles pursued Hector, and Pompey and Jesus were also pursued by enemies. The people begged Hector not to go, whereas Pompey's friends begged him not to go as well, and Peter begged Jesus not to go. Hector quoted what others might say after his death. Pompey quoted Sophocles, and Jesus said the scriptures must be fulfilled. Achilles killed Hector by stabbing him with a spear. Pompey was murdered by being stabbed to death with swords. And the overseer of the assassination was a man called Achilles. Odd coincidence. Not only that, there was a centurion present. Whereas when Jesus was arrested, they came with swords, and there was a centurion present at his death. Before the fight, Achilles called Hector, Noble Hector. The centurion called Pompey, Imperator and Achilles saluted him in Greek. Jesus was also addressed with titles and praise. Judas called him rabbi, and Pilate called him the king of the Jews. Hector thought he recognized his brother there to help him, but it was a trick caused by Athena. Pompey recognized the centurion as someone who once served under him, and Jesus was portrayed by a disciple he recognized. Both Hector and Pompey resolved that they were probably doomed, 
and Jesus predicted his betrayal and death. Achilles killed Hector and dragged his corpse around dishonorably, but was later given a proper burial. Achilles killed Pompey, decapitated his corpse, and left it there to lie dishonorably, but was later given a proper burial. Jesus was killed dishonorably, but was also given a proper burial. Jesus also gave out a great cry at his death. People on Pompey's ship uttered a wailing cry, and Hector's death was followed by shrieking laments of women. There were also women who mourned after the death of Jesus. Hector's father begged Achilles for the corpse, and it was granted. Achilles permitted Pompey's freedman, Philip, to attend to Pompey's corpse. And Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for Jesus' corpse. All three bodies were attended to and wrapped properly. And finally, Hector was later avenged, Pompey was avenged by Caesar, and one could argue Jesus was avenged by the temple's destruction. Despite all these similarities and plot points, it would be absurd to suggest we have to conclude both the story of Jesus and Pompey are fictional, because the story of the death of Hector is fiction and was written first. It is not special pleading to agree there are similarities here, but still believe the story of Pompey and Jesus are historical accounts. These similarities came about coincidentally, and this should not be surprising. Given the vast amount of fictional stories and real-life events written down across the span of history, similar stories are bound to occur. But we humans do not like coincidences, and often prefer to force meaning or connections where there are none. We are a pattern-seeking species, and because of this, we are bound to find patterns that merely exist by coincidence. So even if there were prior stories of dying and rising gods, that would not mean the resurrection of Jesus is also a work of fiction, or that it was concocted based on myths. And even if the Gospel authors knew of dying and rising god myths, that still would not mean Jesus' resurrection was mythical, because ancient authors often wrote about non-fictional events by utilizing already existing stories or literary structures. Furthermore, if we grant for the sake of argument that the God of the Bible exists and he wants to reveal himself to humanity in the person of Jesus, why wouldn't he do so in ways that people understood by what it means to be a deity? For example, Jesus performed miracles to show he was divine, like calming the storms and demonstrating his power over the sea. The reason is, the Jews of the day only thought the Lord had this power. So if Jesus wanted to reveal he was God, we would expect him to do it in ways the people of his day would have understood divinity. He isn't going to turn himself into an Aztec serpent deity and fly through the sky. That might cause him to think he is a demon. Instead, he'll reveal his divinity in ways they already understood. Likewise, if having power over life and death was a clear sign to the ancient world you were of divine origin, why wouldn't God be willing to show his power through such an act like a resurrection? Roman emperors often tried to model themselves in a way to mimic the gods, to prove they were of divine origin. If God actually did come in the flesh and wanted to show he truly was God, we would expect him to do it in ways that people of the day understood divinity. God doesn't need to scour the pagan myths to make sure he never repeated a miracle a pagan deity was said to have performed. In fact, it would make more sense to utilize what the people already understood as a demonstration of divinity. If we look at the Old Testament, there is clearly a precedent set that God wanted to show he could do in reality what the pagan gods could only do in myths. This is seen in God's contest with Baal through the prophet Elijah, or in the account of the ten plagues of Egypt, where God demonstrated he controlled nature and it was not the gods of Egypt. So if the skeptic is right, and there were various myths of dying and rising gods throughout the ancient world, I think we would expect God would be willing to utilize that motif and show he can do in reality what the pagan gods could only do in myth. The truth is the skeptic of the resurrection and the mythicist must come to grips with this conclusion. They have often spent hours trying hard to show there were various myths of dying and rising gods. And even if they are successful, and many scholars doubt this conclusion, they would still need to demonstrate Jesus' resurrection was thought of as another version of the dying and rising god motif. And even scholars who think there were dying and rising gods, like Trigve Medinger, are skeptical even of that, suggesting the pagan dying and rising gods were totally unlike the resurrection of Jesus. They were not in any way classified as the same thing. Even if the skeptic can get over these two hurdles, they then need to demonstrate these myths actually did influence the gospel authors because correlation is not causation. The skeptic needs to demonstrate a causal link beyond finding mere similarities. And finally, even if they are successful in this, it would still not get them to the conclusion they want, 
because it could be equally likely that Jesus' resurrection is historical, and the Gospel authors wanted to make parallels to already existing stories. Or that God wanted to prove he could do in reality what the pagan gods could only do in myths. This is a lot of work for the skeptic that doesn't even get them to the conclusion they want. One would need to use other means to do so, just like the Christian uses other means to argue for the truth of Christianity. In truth, the skeptic is merely falling into the human tendency of jumping to conclusions from finding patterns. But correlation is not causation. Trying to debunk the resurrection of Jesus by utilizing similarities with pagan myths reduces to nothing more than an association fallacy.